Okay, good afternoon. You're still here, you're still awake. Well done, congratulations there. I'd like to say that there is a prize. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's the next two sessions. Well done. Okay, so um, you've been hearing about some new stuff, so I'm here to talk about old is the new new. Um, it's one of the things that I've noticed, um, which, which makes life a little bit easier, is that uh, every time somebody comes up and says, look, this is how we're doing things. This is all new. This is great, and it's fantastic, and it's lovely, and it's wonderful. And um, you look at it, and you go, you know, some of that seems really familiar. Maybe we were do using different words. But for a lot of people, the ideas they're encountering for the first, are for the first time. And the problem is, there's a lot of things that contribute to this problem, that for many people, when they encounter something, this is the first time they've encountered everything as a package. Okay? So for a lot of people, whether it's microservices, whether it's functional programming, they suddenly go, oh, functional programming, immutability. I'd never come across this idea before. Yeah, like in all the other paradigms where immutability is important. Microservices, it's so great, we're separating things out. Yeah, nobody's said that before. It just turns out that I'm not saying that we don't have new ideas, but most of the new ideas are subtle blends of the things that have gone before, and then there's a little extra that is actually new. Sometimes it's just the combination, sometimes it's something else. But for a lot of people, they take the whole thing as new, and then they move on to the next new thing without realizing and assimilating what was already there. And part of it is we have a little bit of a problem with history. We have a very poor tradition of history in um, uh, in software development. And sometimes people say, oh, no, no, that's because software development is so young as a profession. Now, I'm looking around. Software development is older, sometimes at least twice as old as you are. So age is not an issue. Okay? A age, age of the discipline is not an issue. There are other disciplines that are younger. So there's something else going on. And we don't necessarily have a tradition of, of history and study. So... Uh, this does mean, I mean, I'm going to say, as somebody who spends his time training people, running workshops and consulting uh, and writing, this is absolutely fantastic from my point of view. Uh, to borrow this André Gide uh, quote, everything has been said before, but since nobody listens, we must also always start again. Which is great, because it means I just get to recycle the same knowledge and just ask the question, what are we calling it this year? Yeah? Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, we will choose the right tags, and, and, then, and that's great. Um, and... So much so that gathering advice together has, has been something I've been interested in for a while. So uh, this book um, put together a few years ago, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. And for your interest, we are in the process of going to do a 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. Um, obviously, we're just saying Java, but it's the whole Java ecosystem, JVM languages, the works. But anyway, just in case you're thinking, oh, I might like to contribute to that, um, uh, keep your eyes open. Um, and it doesn't have to be new and original. In fact, it turns out that an awful lot of software development is not original. Um, so let me introduce um, Shakespeare. Uh, so he, he was one of the early programmers. Um, problem, though, was hardware issues. It's always hardware issues. He had no problem with imagination. But hardware issues. Um, so the hardware wasn't available um, 400 years ago. So, uh, you know, he had to execute um, his scripts uh, using an actor model, for example. Um, yep, that's right, it's Friday. Um, there's more like that. Okay, so, uh, so, but he put these in. So what we have here, for example, is um, uh, Hamlet, tragedy, um, uh, the tragedy, uh, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Um, this is a whole play about memory management. And for a lot of people, it's sort of pre-Java era, everybody was kind of going with Ophelia. It is in my memory locked, and you yourself should keep the key of it. Malloc, free, new, delete. Okay, it's up to you to manage the memory. And then a lot of people think, no, I'm going to side with Hamlet. You know, Yay, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records. Garbage collection. <laughs> um, you know... And these days, people just sort of say, oh, yeah, this is, this is, you know, we're going to worry about which garbage collector. No, no, Shakespeare had it sorted. It's just that it was very carefully coded, okay? You have to look deeply. Um, and a lot of people, oh, so, so, so Java did, having a JVM, having a virtual machine that brought with it um, garbage collection 
was a, a, a profound shift. For a lot of people, it's the first time they'd come across the idea and, he, and say, oh, yeah, but it's new, it's, it's new in the language. And it's like, well, I don't know, Lisp, uh, first implemented in 1960. Sometimes people call it a 1950s language. If you executed it in your head, yes. First implementation was 1960. This is my copy of the Lisp 1.5 programmer's manual. They were going to do Lisp 2, but they never got that far. Um, and the key point about this is that Lisp brought with it not simply a particular model, um, you know, and other crazy ideas like functional programming um, and uh, the importance of immutability. Uh, it also inspired the idea of uh, virtual machines. In fact, for a master's degree that I did uh, many years ago, I created a Lisp VM that was retargetable and it had its own built-in garbage collector. I thought, that's so obvious an idea. Nobody else is, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody else is doing it. It was a few years before that became so obvious. But these ideas were all around. And you might say, well, okay, that's just a specialist language. That's not a mainstream language. Because everybody in the 1960s was programming in procedural languages. Uh, this is my copy of the Algol 68 manual. The, um, so uh, 1968, Algol, algorithmic language. This was the kind of classic. This was the pinnacle of procedural programming. It is one of the most influential languages you've either never heard of or never used. If you're int, where did int come from? And void, where did it go? Everybody goes, oh, well, that came from C. No, 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 where did it come from? Where did C get it from? Because if you look at the languages of the era, everybody was busy typing out integer. Okay, they were doing the whole thing. And, you know, Java slipped up a bit by going boolean. Algol 68 said, no, nah, we're going to be consistent, bool. Long, short, that was Algol. But it's not just a matter of words. This is a runtime that had a number of interesting things going, uh, including garbage collection. Hmm. Well, okay, let's just take, a very, let's just take an example here. That it, I, I'm swiping this from the uh, JDK pages. Uh, introducing why you want to use Lambda expressions um, with um, apparently variable names don't matter anymore. Um, so, you know, that's, that's great. We're getting back to the 60s. Um, person P, yeah, we can skip all kinds of other things. Um, what we're going to do is try, to, uh, try and print persons older than, and then we set up a list, roster, in age. Okay, we do that, and, and then we think we want to adapt it, print persons within age range, so you have to change this stuff. And you think maybe there's a way of generalizing it, and eventually you come up with a predicate, and you think, ah, oh, right, okay, now we're going to optimize, we're going to introduce this radical idea, um, lambdas. Um, Except apparently if you work for Oracle, you don't know how to format code, so let's fix that. Um, so now we've got a Lambda. And so 2014, everybody in Java land got really excited. It's like, yeah, we're cool. We've got Lambdas. You've got the C++ people going, we had that in 2011. You've got the C Sharp people going like, yeah, whatever. We had it since almost the beginning, version 2 of whatever. The JavaScript people are over here going, hey. We've, we've had those for ages. Then you've got the Lisp programmers going, yep. And you've got the Algol 68 programmers going, yeah, we had that as well. In other words, so I can pass in a block of code. There you go, person P, bool. Gender of P is male. Age of P is greater than 18. Oh, so this was procedural programming. So a lot of people use the term procedural programming to mean bad, okay? Procedural programming, the basic premise of procedural programming is you can pass procedures around. Procedure is the fundamental unit. So something really bad happened in the 1970s. Some people say it was disco, some people say it was flares. But clearly there was, a, there was some kind of extinction level event in terms of our knowledge of our practices to the point that people in 2014 are getting really excited by having a feature that was actually invented in 1932, Lambda Calculus. So I'm looking forward to next year and the year after as the Java releases roll on and we find ourselves working slowly through the late 30s. Into <laughs> so, yeah, so next time you say procedural programming is a really bad idea, pause a moment, okay? So one of the things I have found valuable, one of the things I really got into that I found immensely important was, uh, was patterns many years ago. Um, and 
Uh, one of the things I liked about patterns is they gave you a model of reasoning about problems. They're not just a shopping list of solutions. They, they have a model of reasoning about problems. But one of the most intriguing things about patterns is the way that people normally approach them. They go, yep, we're using patterns in our system. We've got Singleton. OK. I've got Singleton as well. That's mine. You get your own. This one's good for your code. Okay, if you're ever thinking of putting a big global variable in your code, just, just go, and, go and get some whiskey. And, and have a slight sip, slow sip. And there's a kind of a gentle calming effect, a sort of a gentle fire that rolls around your mouth. And it relaxes you. And you suddenly think, you know what, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put that big global variable in there. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do some engineering instead. Okay, it's cool. Um, yeah, so a lot of people, it's just like, oh, right, okay, this is what patterns are. No, no. Um, I, I got a little bit annoyed a few years ago. Everybody got excited about writing manifestos. There was a SOA manifesto. There was all kinds of manifestos. So I decided, you know, if patterns had a manifesto, I was running a workshop at a company, and I thought, you know, it would be simply this. Patterns, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by seeing how others have already done it. As Brian Foote put it, patterns are an aggressive disregard of originality. The whole point of the patterns movement was not to create something new, but was to go back over and say, what have we been doing so far, just so that we know? You know all, the, all this old stuff, let's try and codify some of this design thinking, which is very difficult to do, but nonetheless, it's just a case of like, shall we learn from our past, or should we just try and reinvent it again? It's like, no, maybe we should learn from that, so we can see solution, family, similarities, ah, oh, that's an interesting idea, we can take that, and then you do the clever bit, which is combine it with another thing or add a new twist instead of th perpetually reinventing everything from the ground up. So what we're really talking about here is, is engineering. Glenn Vandenberg gave, gave one of the best definitions of engineering that uh, I've come across. And perhaps your definition of engineering, independent of any discipline, as you're likely to find, the set of practices and techniques that have been determined to work reliably through experience. Now, a number of people sort of said, well, yeah, but in software, we've ended up using software engineering very differently. And, and a lot of people cite um, the uh, 1968 uh, NATO conference on software engineering. They don't simply cite it, they often blame it and say, this was the start of lots of bad things. Waterfall-driven development, plan-driven development. This is all dates back to here. And, an, and uh, a very artificial idea of what is um, uh, of software development and, and so on. And it's just like, well, uh, steady, steady. And some people think that the term was invented for the conference. No, the term was invented by Margaret Hamilton. Uh, she did minor things like write software that gets people to the moon. Um, you know, trivial stuff. Um, so she came up with the term in the mid-60s. Um, I began to use the term software engineering to distinguish it from hardware and other kinds of engineering, yet treat each type of engineering as part of the overall systems engineering process. Uh, I like the, the, the very holistic views. It's like we are building something. There's not a I am building and, you know, you guys are doing something else. Oh, it's the hardware people. It's, it's a very uh, complete view. And so if we go back to software engineering, so I read, I'd previously taken excerpts and dipped into this document. So a few months back, with the recognition that 2018 would be 50 year anniversary of 1968, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and find out a little bit more, go further than the quotes that I've used, um, and try and get a sense of what people were thinking at the time. And they, they came up with such radical ideas like, the design process is an iterative one. Yeah, you see the advocacy for plan-driven development, waterfall, you can sense it in that very sentence. It's cleverly hidden in an invisible font with zero width. And now, I'm not going to say they were all sitting there nodding, agreeing, that, because they had a diversity of thinking that you expect from a group of people. But nonetheless, this guy wasn't the only guy saying this. This is quite important. It turns out quite a lot of them were saying the same thing. And as I went through the document, there were some very interesting things. So the word iterative turns up quite a lot. Unit test, which I'd previously only been able to date to the 1970s as a phrase. No, 1960s. Middleware, that was a surprise to me. I dated that to the late 70s or early 80s. I was wrong. You know, so uh, Christopher Alexander, the guy who invented patterns, he gets mentioned all over the place. Modularity, declarative stuff, Conway's law. Although they didn't call it a law then, 
but you know that's uh, it's just like what, 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 was, what was going on and uh, so this lovely quote from Douglas Ross the most deadly thing in software is the concept which almost universally seems to be followed somebody's complaining about this in 1968 that you are going to specify what you're going to do and then do it and that is where most of our troubles come from <laughs> it's just like this is 1968 it's just that like, oh yeah we're really bad at history so you know, how bad? Well, let's go back 4,000 years. We did 400 a moment ago. Let's go back four. You see, you, you look at this. This is sort of a timeless quality to it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... I managed, uh, this is a shot I took last year on Valentine's Day because that's how romantic me and my wife are. Um, what should we do? Yeah, let's take the kids down to Salisbury Plain and just go and check that out. And the kids were there. The kids were there. Looking at, they'd seen pictures. But they were like you when you encounter a legacy system. How did they do that? Why? Why did they do that? Who knows how they constructed it? There is no rhyme or reason. We cannot find the documentation, and it certainly doesn't agree with this stuff. What does it all do? I don't know, but twice a year, it all lines up and gives the right answers. You know, it's just... So, you know... This gives us the Greek, monolithos, one stone, one very, very big stone. When you know from everything that you've been taught, what you want is like you know, an elegant arrangement like this. My, my younger son did this, well, many years ago, and he was about five, five or six. He even put a nice little Japanese aesthetic seaweed on it. just like, this is what you're thinking. This is what I want my system to look like, these elegant pebbles, carefully arranged, beautiful. And it's just like, yeah, decomposition, single responsibility principle. Oh, these are all really radical new ideas. Doug McElroy, early 1970s. This is the Unix philosophy. Write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. Hmm. A lot of people kind of look at this and go, ah, microservices. And I go, well, you know, if that makes you feel good, yes. Yeah? If that's how you want to read that, that's absolutely fine. Because obviously that's a completely new idea. Um, define a subset of the system which is small enough to bring to an operational state, then build on that subsystem. This strategy requires the, subsystem, uh, the system be designed in modules, which can be realized, tested, and modified independently, apart from conventions for intermodule communication. 1968. Now, notice this is very different to the way that people often talk about modules. This is very much bring it to an operational state. It's very much... Uh, it doesn't have our modern sensibilities of deployment, Sure. But there's an awful lot here that it seems strangely familiar. And as we've used the word modules, and people got very excited about modules um, uh, recently, it's a case like, right, okay, so what does that involve? Um, so we go back to the 1990s, so that's actually relatively recent. Some of you were born. Uh, yeah. Uh, Clem Sapersky was writing this book, kind of very much as component software was, I won't say it was dying at this point, but it was kind of like it had hit its peak. It kind of hit its peak as a kind of a, a, a fad about the 96. Um, a software component is a unit of composition with contractually specified interfaces and explicit context dependencies only. A software component can be deployed independently as subject to third-party composition. Hmm. Again, this seems strangely familiar. You, know, you can just cut. You, know, you could actually. In fact, here's a challenge: if you get bored and you try and document your new system, just use little fragments. You know, found fragments from documentation over the last century, and just see if you can work it in there and make it sound really 2018. And our sensibilities clearly go back further. You know, you just don't get book covers like this anymore. You know, there's a, there's a reason for that. There's a reason I've, I need eyesight correction. You know, it's a, it's a, so 1970s, um, cohesion is a measure of the strength of association of the elements inside a module. Any attempt to divide them up would only result in increased coupling and decreased readability. There's a sense that your, this is where we talk about single responsibility principle. None of these things is, is new. And we say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's new because, you know, what we normally end up with is this. That's my microservice architecture. Yeah, surely our understanding of things like technical debt and so on is really new. Technical debt is a term from 1992. It just took until the 21st century for people to, you know, kind of rediscover it as a concept. Um, but Alan Perlis, we, he go, this goes back further. In the long run, every program becomes Rococo. If you're not sure what Rococo is, it makes Baroque look minimal. Then rubble. 
So we think, okay, so I'm going to need to change this stuff. We're going to write code. We're going to need to change it. Um, how are we going to do this? Well, if we're going to change this stuff, what is one of the reasons, what is one of the obstacles that we fear? Well, you know, we, we don't want to break things, do we? Yeah, but we don't have any tests. You know, testing is a really kind of, you know, new idea, particularly integrating it into the development process so you don't just do it at the end. Oh, here's Alan Perlis again. 1968, a software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of being used after the design. What happened? And how interlaced do you get? Well, people often go, oh, no, 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 okay, TDD, that's like, you know, totally new. Absolutely, yeah, the whole idea that you write a test first and then you implement the functionality. So in other words, in one sense, and this will satisfy football pundits everywhere, you are always running at 110% coverage. Because you've always got more coverage than you have code. That's the idea. It's just like, I've got, I've got so much coverage, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even pass the tests. I've got more tests than I have code. That's how much coverage I've got. Yeah? Yeah, that's a, that's a new idea. It dates back to the 1970s. Um, Alfred Aho, we instituted a rigorous regression test for all of the features of ORC. Um, if you've not come across ORC, it's a lovely little language with a very different um, rule-based uh, execution model, uh, pattern, uh, pattern matching model. And um, it, uh, it's kind of like, it, it, it's kind of like, well, it got displaced by Perl, um, but uh, ORC has the virtue of being readable. Um, and Alfred Aho, he made the observation, any of the, he described how they built it. Any of the three of us, Aho, Weinberger, Kernigan, uh, Ork, any of the three of us who put in a new feature into the language first had to write a test for the new feature. Yep, so TDD, that's new. But surely BDD is new, behavior-driven development. You know, the whole given when then thing. That's got to be a new idea, this kind of structuring. Now, Jason Gorman pointed out, given when then is in fact what we call a whore triple. Um, this is the original model. This dates back to uh, the late 1960s, I think 1969, an axiomatic basis for uh, uh, program construction. Um, uh, precondition, action, and consequence. Given that you surpass the precondition, when you P, when you execute Q, then R is true. And this was also reinvented in use cases in the 1980s and uh, 1990s. Uh, precondition, trigger, um, and postcondition. Um, I'm, I'm excited to find out what words we're going to use in the next decade um, instead of given when then. I quite like given when then. Certainly better than PQR. That's a bit of an improvement. Um, but nonetheless, this kind of idea, this triple that surrounds the thing of interest that we're trying to build is not, not a new idea. Now, of course, we're going to separate all these things out. So perhaps we care about you know, putting things back together again. So Dijkstra sort of talks about, well, what is it that we're going to put together? And loose ends kind of suggest this question of threads. Because threads are a form of composition. So I, there's a lovely little um, talk that I came across. It was 2013, it's Brett Victor. And what's fascinating about this talk is he does the talk as if he was giving a talk in 1973, looking to the future. What will the future hold? What will, what will programming be like in 40 years' time? And so he says, from the point of view of 1973, you know, they're kind of a dead end, right? So I think we're still using threads and locks. We should, you know, like pack up and go home because we've clearly failed as an engineering field. Um, he's st I, I, I believe he might be correct. So we have this rather curious case that we seem to have picked on a very weak idea. Now, threads are a very powerful construct. In fact, they are, uh, and this is quite important, we must understand the difference between um, uh, uh, something that is powerful and something that captures our abstractions. Uh, thread is like a go-to. A go-to is the most powerful um, uh, construct in a sequential program, because out of a go-to, you can build all the other control flow structures. And so somebody went ahead and proved this in the 1970s that it's actually the most powerful construct. But with great power comes great responsibility. And threads is too low a level. Threads, out of threads, you can build anything. You can build actors. Um, you can build 
a wonderful set of models. It's just that you don't really want that as your raw tool. Otherwise, you go right back to thinking, oh, I'm going to program in C, and I'll build my objects out of, um, of structures and function pointers. So this came along at the end of the 80s. Um, an idea, uh, no, coordination languages. Um, David Galanta and others talked about this very attractive idea, which is a really good separation of concerns. It expresses a really good separation of concerns. And I found that I use this as a way of thinking about stuff, even if I, even if I am not working in something that was formally considered to be coordination language-based, we can build a complete programming model out of two separate pieces, the computation model and the coordination model. The idea is that what you do is you say, here's my simple little pieces of computation, which I can understand and test very, very easily. And then I coordinate them. The threading model is outside. Okay, at the very simplest, we're talking about executors, but you might be talking about something far more, uh, far more sophisticated. And, and here is applied this to um, the uh, Linda model, which kind of abortively ended up as a kind of uh, Gini-type stuff in the late 90s in Java. But this is a much deeper philosophy, the idea of separating out your tasks and then gluing them together at a different level. Whereas often what we end up with is these two are meshed together. And I, I, I'm familiar with this one because when, uh, uh, when I visit some companies, one of the most common questions is, how do I test my threaded code? How do I unit test my threaded code? I said, well, it should be fairly easy. You, you test the task. You know, first of all, let's just you know, separate out. You know, it's, it's the art of the possible. Let's just separate out. First of all, you take those nice little sequential bits, and those got nice, nicely factored out dependencies, you know, because you know, we've all learned about dependencies and cohesion, because those are really old ideas. And then you test those, and then you've got a coordination model above that, and that you're going to need to test slightly separately, but you might not be able to. Get, that's more a game of confidence. And people go, that sounds great. We don't have that. I say, I know. You wouldn't have asked me the question otherwise. So it turns out we've known this answer for a long time. Now, we have also, and this is, and this is the one that really, really messes with people when they say, right, we're, we're being really cool. We are using functional programming. Oh, what are you using? You've got, you got, you got this wonderful hierarchy. The Haskell programmers put themselves at the top. Of course they would. They don't get to be at the top because to put yourself at the top is a side effect. Okay? They don't get that. But you've got the closure people looking down on the Scala people. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're purer than you and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and everybody's kind of like fighting it out as to who's got the best language, who's got the most like obscure type theory related stuff, who's got, who's closest to category theory. It's just like, yeah, we, we, are, we are true, pure, and so on. That is what defines the hallmark of this stuff. We are pure, we are wonderful. What are those guys over there doing in the accounts department? They've been functional programming for decades, and it pisses people off. It's just like, yeah, yeah, but that's a really messy way of doing it. I have news for you. Every paradigm has its mess. That's the bit that gets popular. And then there's a few people going, oh, the purest of objects, the purest of functions. No, it is, unfortunately, it's a pure data flow model. That's what you get. Let's ignore the fact that VB script, just sort of, let's call VB script, uh, or VBA, sorry, right, wrong context. VBA is like a monad. Um, I'm going to leave that one there for you to think about. Um, so Excel, you know, Excel, the spreadsheet itself, is a pure functional model. Data flow. It doesn't even have any keywords. How pure do you want? Okay? That's it. You just wire it up and cause people mistakes and you trash the economies of various countries because it turns out that it's not a very good type model. Maybe they should have paid a little more attention to the type system and a few other little questions of correctness, you know. Um, but nonetheless, you have that. And that's a coordination model. It really is data cells and relationships and transformations. Now, if we're talking about data flow and transformations, then for a lot of people, they're kind of thinking, aha, I got you. Java 8, streams, very exciting. So really useful, a couple of years back, um, the Rebel Labs, uh, folks did this. I, I, love, I love these little cheat sheets. They're great. But it also helped clarify for me the power of a useful abstraction approach. Okay, so what we have is a number of examples. And there was a, I remember looking at the examples, the stream examples in the middle. 
get the unique surnames in uppercase of the first 15 book authors that are 50 years old or over. And I looked at that, and I went through it, and I thought, that's wrong. Which, so I tweeted that, and then they fixed it to a thing that was different but also wrong, differently wrong. Now, the great thing is that it's actually easy to explain. So let's walk through it. Okay, so let's choose a more favorable font size. What does this actually do? And what, what we see here is a power, an idea of procedural abstraction, or functional abstraction. I can go either way on this one. What you're trying to do is reveal the underlying concept verbally. And so what we're going to do is we take a library of books. It's going to be, a library is going to be a collection of books. We're going to stream it. We're going to map all the books to, uh, to get the author of the books. Um, just as an interesting point, if you are trying to, um, if you're trying to sound all kind of functional and stuff, one of the differences between functional thinking and imperative thinking is that imperative thinking is based on commands. You say, we're going to do this. We're going to change this. Okay? It's a command-based thing, whereas functional thinking is much more declarative. We sort of resort to other parts of speech. You're focused on relationships and properties of things. So just as a small point, and it's a minor Java heresy, um, but I'm prepared to, I'm prepared to uh, uh, be crucified for it, I just want to point out that the word get is about as imperative as you can get in the English language. Get is an imperative word. It means to change the state of something. Okay? It does not mean I'm going to ask you a question. You don't get, somebody, you don't get somebody's age. You, know, you might get somebody, but that's a, slight, you know, that's, a, that's a different thing. You don't get somebody's age, you ask them their age. If you get money from a cash machine, it has a disappointing side effect on your bank account. Okay? <laughs> You get married, there's a huge, great state change in your life. Yeah, get is a word that means I am going to, just before this talk, I went to get coffee. There's a state change that me, the coffee machine, and that cup all shared. Okay? It was all about relationships. Okay? And I've got a very good relationship with that coffee. So if you want to sound functional, can I just say get rid of the word get? Yeah? Or should I just say rid of the word or transform that sentence to have no gets? The point there is it's the author. It's the age. And so what we do is we filter out the author. We, we limit that to 15. Okay, hang on, wait a minute. What have we got here? We're going to get the authors. We're going to get all the authors that are 50 or older, and then we're going to limit that to 15. Ah, the problem here is that we are not, we're not following the specification because the specification um, is about the first 15 book authors, not the authors of the first 15 books. There's a very subtle difference, um, unfortunately. If I've got a whole load of books that have the same author, then I'm going to truncate it at the wrong point. So I've gone and put the limit 15 in the wrong place. Then we get the surname, shift to uppercase, uniquify, and convert it to a list. So let's try changing it in the way that was um, then proposed. Let's get the author. Same age filter. Get the surname, shift to uppercase, now uniquify. Ah, the problem, and then limit to 15. The problem here is that we've ended up with the um, we've ended up with the surnames, we've ended up with the unique surnames, or the 15 unique surnames. Ah, that's not quite what we were after, because if I've got two different authors called Smith, then that should fall, ah, the limit's in the wrong place. It turns out that the right way to do this is you need to, un you need to uniquify in two places. Uniquify by author identity. In fact, you can shift that up if you want. Get the authors, uniquify them, now filter out, do a select, and then dun, 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 do a take 15, get selling, get set, and then uniquify again. So this is right. Now, what I like about this is that it's really easy to walk through because you can explain it to somebody who does not know streams because you can walk through each step and make it clear. It, one of the things I find fascinating, and it was examples like this that made me brought everything together, that when I suddenly really discovered, ah, human beings like sequences. This is sequential programming, not sequential programming in the way that you might think about it. We like sequences. If we can organize things in a sequence, in an order of something, then we're happy. If you can't, we're less happy. Okay? And here is a sequence. I've got a flow. I can describe each step. And we're very proud of ourselves for doing that. And then we go back to 1964, and Doug McElroy got there first. This is the invention of the Unix pipeline. Um, so... 
There we go. To put my strongest concerns in a nutshell, one, we should have some way of coupling process, uh, process uh, like garden hoses, screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way, and this is the way of I.O. also. It took them six years to find the pipe symbol on the keyboard. That was Ken Thompson that did that. But the idea, the computation, that was all there. The pipeline model, data flow is a first-class concept of how we should do coordination. That's a classic original coordination model. So even Galanta was late because we'd already been using those for, um, for decades. That idea is immensely powerful. Separate out the small parts and then compose them. It's a compositional model. This was all there. I'm not, as again, I'm not saying everybody knew it and everybody did it, but it was there. We need to look much more closely. In fact, I, I did this example a couple of years ago, Java Zone in Oslo, and uh, Trisha G saw it, and she said, that would have been really good. That was really good, except what would have been really helpful is if you'd shown what the other code would have looked like. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's good. So I did that, and it doesn't work at the same font size. Um, so let's change the font size. And this is one of those things, whenever you look at legacy Java code, you're sitting there going like, wow. And hope you might be, I mean, for all I know, you're creating tomorrow's legacy today. But you look at, all, all, you look at the code, and you're sitting there going like, we get paid by the line of code. I really hope we get paid by the line of code. Because you're sitting there going, I'm writing another loop. And you think, how many loops have you written in your life? I think you have written all of the loops you will ever need to write. Really, extract them. You know, that, that's, that's an idea. Um, so, you know, and, but also the, the point here is to do with correctness and our ability to reason about stuff, which was classically defined as the Unix way, um, that if we look at the first version, this, that's the second version. You can't necessarily tell it's any more or less correct than the first version. And this is the correct version. You can't actually tell that that's more or less correct than any of the other versions. What is absolutely fascinating is that Doug McElroy, or Donald Knuth, was given a challenge by uh, John Bentley in the 1970s to try and use his literate programming system, which was a system whereby you were trying to document the code um, in a document, uh, and you meshed in the code, and then the build system would pull out the code and build it for you. It's kind of a nice idea in theory, and, uh, but in practice it doesn't work out quite as well as you'd hope. And Don Knuth wrote about 20 pages worth of code and documentation, all of this in Pascal, a very elegant, kind of handcrafted, you know, lovingly artisan-based data structures. Doug McElroy then promptly rewrote it in six lines of Unix shell script and pointed out the bugs in his original implementation. So, in other words, when we start getting excited about being expressive and stuff, this was all a done deal. So, what, when it comes to dealing with code, the one, one of the things we've always known, and I'm going to borrow from a, uh, the writer, Elmore Leonard, uh, try to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. This is quite good advice for most things. But there's this uh, deeper idea I want to pick up on, and software development can only be considered immature because of how we use our experience, not because we lack experience. Currently, we run the planet, which is a, an interesting position to be in. Um, they used to think it was physics, but it turns out we've, we've managed to displace that. Um, and there's this notion, there's no lack of experience, but what we perhaps lack is a coordination of that experience or a recognition of some of the ideas um, that have been around. That doesn't mean that every idea is good. It doesn't mean because somebody did something 40 or 50 years ago, everybody knew about it, but it turns out the idea was present. And it, in many cases, our advances have been embarrassingly weak. And sometimes people will tell me, no, no, look, look, I'm programming in a completely different world to what it was back then. I mean, look, I've got like, I've got two iMac screens on my desktop. You know, I've got this, I've got that, and you know, it all runs really quickly. And I say, yeah, yeah, but that's hardware. That's all been enabled by hardware. Nothing you have said about all of your cores and all of your memory is actually a software thing. It's actually all hardware. It's just been enabled. Everybody imagined this stuff. Um, possibly one of the few things that we can say is new is the machine learning model. That was in the mid-1980s, uh, Rommel Hart McClelland. So we've moved forward to the 80s and shoulder pads, moving from flares to shoulder pads. Um, but there is this notion that perhaps we should pay a little more attention to the things that are around us, the things that sometimes people on the edge are kind of arguing about or disagreeing about. 
and look at that and go, you know what, maybe there's something to that. Maybe our reasons for rejecting an idea are because it's different um, or because not everybody's doing it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this idea of looking to it and connecting it back with a history. So there's this kind of interesting thought that you can spend an awful lot of time, and uh, for, for years I thought we were making progress, and then I just realized that all I was doing was learning about the stuff I didn't know. And that there is this idea that you eventually come back to all of the early stuff. I found myself going back to a lot of stuff and really extracting the original knowledge. We now have more experience about some of these things, wisdom that simply people did not have. But pay more attention. Thank you very much.